the COVID-19 pandemic has put the spotlight on virologists. Well, right now. But their star status has also made them the target of public anger, even death threats. And people, because of their lack of trust and authority, would not want to take the vaccine. People think that we want to shut the country down. Anthony Fauci has gained a huge following, but not everyone. You know, Biden wants to lock it down. He wants to listen to Dr. Fauci. He wants to listen to Dr. Fauci. Germany, too, has spawned its science superstars, like Christian Drosten. His podcast is one of the most popular in the country. Alexander Kikoli is a regular guest on German talk shows. He sparred with politicians over their virus response at the beginning of the crisis. But as social media memes feed the echo chamber, are these new celebrities serving to further polarize scientific debate? Well, different views are vital in the world of science. Asking questions is key. At the end of the day, people believe what they want to believe, but should we trust science or the scientist? They're only human, and this crisis has been full of uncertainties. Still, science is not about certainties. It's about constraining what we don't know. Some of the best-known virologists in Germany work here at the University Hospital in Bonn. Some refer to it as the Strake Institute after its leader, researcher Hendrik Strake. He's 43 years old and well-known in medical circles, thanks to his work in the fight against HIV. But now researchers across Europe know his name, due to the coronavirus, or SARS-CoV-2, pandemic. Here we added a concentration of the plasma from a person who was infected with SARS-2 and we can show that plasma can inhibit the virus, that the patient has developed antibodies which can neutralize the virus. Since drugs hardly work against the virus, he is relying on the development of a vaccine. When that will happen is unknown. There is cause for optimism because we're currently doing so many vaccine trials and so much research is being put into it, so that if things go very well, we can have a vaccine in January or later next year. But history has taught us that it sometimes takes years or even decades until a vaccine is found. If, or once one's found, the mad rush will be on. But will it be a case of richer countries getting their hands on it first, leaving poorer nations to struggle with the virus? When a vaccine is available, I'm sure that it will be available worldwide, especially in less developed countries, maybe even for free there, or at least at a very low cost. In the meantime, testing is key. The Dank Lab has been using molecular PCR tests that detect the genetic material from the virus and have results within hours. Antigen tests detect specific proteins on the surface of the virus. They aren't as reliable, but they're faster. You can get the result within 15 minutes, which can be given directly to the patient, and a highly infectious person can be isolated and therefore unable to infect others. How people get infected is something researchers agree on, via microscopic particles spread by breathing, so-called aerosol particles. At first, it was unclear whether people could get infected from contaminated surfaces. For example, someone could have just sneezed into their hand and then touched the doorknob. And then other people could touch it and bring it straight up to the mucous membranes. It's rare, but it could happen. Whether people can have multiple infections has long been debated. Can those who have recovered from coronavirus become reinfected, or are they protected against getting sick again? 
So far, there have been over 40 million infections worldwide, but only five cases of people who've been infected again with the virus. This actually proves there's an immunity. Artworks from Africa are on display in Streak's office. For decades, he's travelled the continent. He's worked in hospitals in Uganda and South Africa. The time I spent in Africa showed me the importance of vaccines and how much more there is to research in this area. Above all, in his speciality, HIV. And now, though, in COVID-19, too, with a view to the fight against the coronavirus in Africa. Annette Les Moman is a professor of science, communication and linguistics at the Karlsruhe Institute for Technology in Germany. Annette, immunity, masks and surfaces. The, the opinions are wide ranging. The advice has changed dramatically. Does science have a communication problem? I wouldn't say that this is a communication problem. It's a communication challenge. Why? Because uh, science and society, science and politics are very, very distinct um, social systems. Science is highly specialized. Experts communicate in very, very specialized ways. And their methods and ways of working are highly, highly specialized. So it's intrinsically a, a, a challenge to communicate about this. And this is what we know every day, that you need to connect with the public. And um, there are many ways of uh, being misunderstood or making oneself not understandable in this communication. Why is it such a challenge? Just explain to us what scientific assessment actually is. Well, scientific assessment means what sometimes in the public seems like changing opinion all the time, um, which is actually, in fact, um, and highly, uh, and uh, especially in corona times, um, very sped up um, ev evolvement of ideas. So we wouldn't want um, corona experts and COVID-19 experts to tell us the same thing as half a year ago. This would be very, very old knowledge. So it's changing um, on very high speed, and people collect data and um, assess data mm -hmm. and can have different assessments of these data. This is the normal thing that in, in science you can have um, disputes and uh, discussions on, on findings. But, but so, if it's, um, if it's for, changing all the time, Annette, uh, how can we trust science? That's a um, very good question. We need informed trust. Blind trust would be something like, I, I'm believing everything uh, what people say, this is not such a good idea. But informed trust would be that we um, look at um, what kind of expert do I have in front of me? Do I have an expert on, let's look at myself, science communication, so maybe I can trust this person more than someone from another area who is talking about science communication. And that's the same with um, virology, for example, that um, you might uh, want to listen to someone who's actually studying this topic and not, for example, an engineer. Another criterion for informed trust is um, benevolence. So you look at, um, is this person really interested in the well-being and the welfare of society or not? But you're presuming that people are listening, and there are a lot of people who don't seem to be listening to science or the scientists. Yeah, this is a, a, a big problem, of course, because science communication is not just about um, conveying information. It's about reaching out to people. And people are very much driven by their identities, for example, and their values. So if you're, for example, very much fostering um, um, a freedom and if you're a very much a free person and you're saying I'm not wanting anyone to tell me anything about what I should do or if I should put on a mask then it's difficult to reach out to these people then you have to talk about values why is this so important for you so scientists sometimes also have to talk about freedom and identity and not about their research it's a lot to ask for all them. Annette Lesmoman from the Karlsruhe Institute for Technology. Thank you very much. Time to let you ask the questions. All you have to do is send them to our YouTube channel. Our science correspondent, Derek Williams, will do the rest.
Can you tell us more about fomites and how long the virus remains infectious on surfaces? Fomites are objects that are contaminated by a sick person that can pass an infectious pathogen along to others. Um, our thinking about them in the current pandemic has evolved a lot since the beginning of the year. Um, experts at the WHO and, and other health authorities now say that fomites play at most a secondary role in the, in the spread of COVID-19. And the general consensus is that, that surface transmission might be possible, but is likely pretty uncommon. Um, however, a few weeks ago, a new study came out of Australia that's drawn attention back to the question of how much danger fomites might potentially pose. Um, so let's take a look at it. The study sought to show what effects different temperatures have on viral viability on various surfaces over time. And the result that raised eyebrows was that at 20 degrees Celsius, the researchers detected potentially infectious virus on some materials for up to 28 days. Wow, uh, that's a long time for a surface to remain potentially infectious, right? Uh, but the thing is, those experiments were carried out under very virus-friendly conditions. Um, for example, the viral-laden test droplets that the researchers used were a standardized solution. They weren't mucus, which is thought to be a much more hostile environment uh, for pathogens. And, and samples were also kept in the dark the whole time because UV light quickly deactivates SARS-CoV-2. Um, in other words, Though interesting, the results don't reflect what happens in the real world, which is why experts haven't changed recommendations. And, and most remain convinced that the role that surfaces play in COVID-19 transmission is small. 